right, y'all, so we are going to dive into the Word now. Open your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 16. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand and we will get one to you. You're going to want to follow along with us in the Word. Uh, for those of you who are visitors, you are excluded from my announcement. If you are here visiting or on vacation, we want to serve you. We're not trying to guilt you into serving your first day here, okay? But if you come back a second time, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you family now. All right, I want to say aloha to our online family. Thank you guys for joining us. There are places you guys can serve too. Uh, you know, Jen is over there always kind of chatting with you guys and having that conversation. So if you are online, you can also serve as well. So I'm going to recap for us where we're at. Again, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We will get one over to you. You're going to want to follow along with us. We're going to be in Mark chapter 16. I'm going to recap for us last week. So we are in the part of the narrative of Jesus' life where he has now been buried in the tomb. And what we saw last week was this very simple statement, but it's very powerful. And that is God is sovereign. Or as Waxer likes to say, God is large and in charge. That's right. God is sovereign. And we saw that his sovereignty should grant us peace. We saw the way that he sovereignly cared for the body of Christ in order to make this prophecy come to pass, right? Part of the sovereignty of God is that God does not bow to the culture. God does not treat us the way that the culture treats us. He does not treat the truth the way that the culture treats the truth because he is sovereign. He ordains what is true and what is not. He ordains what we are worth and what we are not. And we saw that part of the reason Jesus stood out from among his peers was the way that he treated women. Right? Culturally, it was a very patriarchal society. Men ruled. Women weren't necessarily uh, equal to men in this time. That didn't matter to Jesus. Jesus sat with women. He talked to them. They were among his disciples who followed him. When Pentecost happens, the women are there praying and ministering. We see that the women were the ones who were there at the cross. They're actually going to see Jesus be buried while the men are hiding away. All right, we said this isn't a, a rah-rah, like let's cheer on the women moment. Not at all. This was a look at God and his sovereignty. And that he loves us. There is no partiality with God. He is sovereign. So he does not need to bow or shift with the culture. Then we looked at Joseph of Arimathea, this secret disciple, this rich man, this member of the council who the other 11 disciples probably would have looked down upon because he was a secret disciple. But while the disciples are hiding, this man is willing to get his hands dirty. He is going to take the body of Christ off the cross. He is going to care for him and prepare him for burial. Right? This secret disciple. Now we saw that Joseph had to gather up courage in order to go and talk to Pilate. Right? We looked at why. The Jews and the Romans were not getting along. Pilate had a long day. His wife was chiming in on some stuff. And he was just all kinds of messed up. And then here comes this member of the council. But we saw that Pilate grants the body to Joseph because God is sovereign. Now imagine how bold Joseph would have been if he had known that he was the one that God was going to use to fulfill that prophecy. How much confidence would he have walked into that room with? Hey, Pilate, give me. <laughs> God said, right? Like the confidence with which he could have come in if he understood that God is sovereign. God sovereignly orchestrates countless details, right? Putting Joseph on the council, making sure he was a rich man, providing for him the tomb that was very near the burial site because they had to get him in before the Sabbath. All of these tiny little details that escape us, God sovereignly ordained, controlled, and saw because he is sovereign. And that sovereignty grants us peace because if he's going to care for the body of Jesus with this much detail, this much providence, divine protection, and love, how much more so will he care for the body of Christ today? Us as the church, how much more so will he watch over us? Listen, the world is getting crazier and crazier and crazier. None of this catches God by surprise. He is sovereignly working in and through us to minister to those in our communities, in our homes, to us, so that he might be glorified. Whatever we're going through, trust that God is sovereign and his providence and his sovereignty can grant us peace. Amen? And we saw that nobody is outside of God's mercy. We look at his entourage, right? His crew that is surrounding him. You've got Pharisees, Nicodemus. You've got tax collectors. You've got members of the council. You have a woman who has seven demons. You have a doubter in Thomas, a denier in Peter. He's got all of these like people who would be looked down upon by society surrounding him. And we saw that God loves all. The ones who come to him, who repent and trust, trust him, who put their faith in him. These are the ones who will be saved. So it does not matter how much sin we have, his mercy is more. Amen? No one is outside of his love. And so last week we saw that God is sovereign. Today we're going to see this, that God is awesome. And when I say awesome, I don't mean like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, right? Like <laughs> something that I've learned uh, doing youth ministry for all these years is words matter. If you're talking to a kid and you say one word out of place, they're going to remember that because words matter. 
And it's funny because vocabulary with today's generation is getting less and less, uh, let's say, eloquent. <laughs> they make up more and more words. Every six weeks, I've got to figure out what this means now, right? If I try to get them to go read somebody like Tozer, I, I have to go and read like the dictionary as I'm reading Tozer, right? This man's words are so deep and so eloquent because he understood that words matter. And so when I say today that God is awesome, I don't mean in the way that we use it today. Because awesome today means slightly above average, right? <laughs> that pizza was awesome. <laughs> Listen, pizza can only get so good, all right? Like, let's be real here. But when I say God is awesome, what I mean is this, that he is worthy of our all. That we should look to him with fear and reverence and respect and glory. When we look at him, it should stir in our hearts to go, whoa. He is different. He is holy. God is awesome in the truest sense of the word. So as we go through the text today, we're going to see that. So before we dive in, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for everything that you've already done here this morning. To see these families come up and celebrate everything that you have done to bring them together, to bring life into these kids and everything that you will do to watch over them. Your sovereignty brings us peace as we look to their lives, knowing that you will raise them up. We thank you that you will never leave or forsake them. For us here now, Lord, as we come to you, I pray that we would come with expectancy. Hearts and minds understanding that our God is holy and desires to do mighty things. Help us to not fall into the, the trap of ritual or just continuing to do something we've always done. Let this be a time where your children come to sit with their father. I ask that you would anoint me, Lord, that your Holy Spirit be upon me, that everything that I speak would bring you glory and honor would bring your children to salvation, would bring the salvation to the lost, that in all things you would be made much of. Glorify yourself today, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to be in Mark chapter 16. We're actually going to be ending our study of Mark today. So find me now in verse 1 of Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. All right, so we are going to end here in verse 8. And if you look in your Bibles, verses 9 through 20 for most of you will be in brackets. If you have a King James or a New King James, the text will continue uh, like normal. But for the rest of us, there's brackets around verses 9 through 20. I'm going to explain why those are there. I'm going to explain why we have the Bible or how we got the Bible that we have in our hands. And I'm going to try not to turn this into a seminary class. Um, but I want us to understand that when we hold the word, this isn't just some game of telephone that we happen to come upon, right? Like, the way that the word came to be here in my hands and in yours is God sovereignly ordained these things. And so I'm going to show us some evidence as to why we can trust the word and then why we're only going to stop at verse 8 here. So first thing I want us to understand is this. How did we get the Bible that is in our hands now? And again, the popular opinion is game of telephone, right? Paul said something to this dude, then this dude repeated it, this dude repeated it for thousands of years, and that's how you have the Bible today. The problem is, if you've played that game of telephone in school, you know that the first person who said something and the last person who said something are saying two different things, because all it takes is one kid to go, <laughs> and say something dumb, right? <laughs> and then the whole message is thrown off because of this one dude, and if that's how we got the Bible, hey, we are wasting our time here. But that's not how this works. How do we have the Bible that we have today? We have 25,000 plus manuscripts of the New Testament that we take from in order to get the word that we have today. Thousands and thousands of manuscripts from different languages, and even that people will go, well, see so you're translating from this language and that language. Any translator worth his salt to have the Bible that you have today has gone to the original manuscripts in the original language in which it was written and translated from that. The reason I say we have different languages is that we can look to those languages and see, okay, we're all saying the same thing. Now, here's where people get tripped up. We do not have the original documents, meaning if we're looking at a letter of Paul, we don't have his original letter. People get tripped up on that. They go, well, see, if we had the original, then we would know for sure. Eh, I don't think so. 
And here's why. I know people. If we had an original letter written by one of the apostles, we know that we're really good at making idols out of things, yeah? Taking something that God has done or touched and making that something that we worship or praise. And if we had an original, can you imagine how many people would want to just lay their hands on that thing and, and go and worship at that place? Listen, the veil of the temple is torn. There is no place more holy or, or less holy. We are the body of Christ and when we gather, we might worship and pray to God. But if we had this original letter, imagine how much people would make that an idol. Here's the other thing. If we had the original and no other manuscripts, how easy would it be for somebody to go, yeah, but Paul could have written anything. Who knows what he was, he had an agenda, right? We don't have the originals, but here's the beauty of all these manuscripts. If 25,000 manuscripts all say the same thing, can we look at that with confidence and go, yeah, that's accurate. If all those manuscripts, except let's say 10, if all the manuscripts say, we are saved by grace through faith. And then 10 manuscripts said, we are saved by cheese and crackers. <laughs> Should we go, oh no, how are we saved? No, you're going to know that the other 24,950 something manuscripts are accurate and that these ones are wrong. You see what I'm saying? And so the plethora of manuscripts doesn't lend to, ah, see the Bible is false. It actually lends to, you can try to disprove it all you want. There's 25,000 writings that all say the same thing. Now, Let's say we do it with the manuscripts. Let's say we just look to the early church fathers, right? These men who, who had maybe these original documents. If we were to take all the writings of the church fathers and gather them together, we could construct the entirety of the New Testament just from their writings. They quoted scripture so much, we can take and reconstruct the entirety of the New Testament. And so there is evidence upon evidence upon evidence as to why the word we hold in our hands is good. Now I'm gonna say this before I continue. One of the cool things about God is whatever you are looking for, he usually lets you find. What I mean by that is this. If you're looking for a reason to not trust the Bible, you'll find it. If you're looking to see who God truly is, well, you'll find it. He says, seek me and you will find me, right? Now, if we come to the word and go, all right, I'm gonna try to find everything wrong with this book, I promise you, you'll find it. But if we come to it and go, God, I need to know if you're real or not, show me. He's faithful. He will show you. So now, why are we stopping at verse 8 in Mark? Here's why. Uh, if you look at those brackets, there's little footnotes under them for some of us, and it'll say stuff like, uh, the earlier manuscripts didn't have these verses included. Right? So I'm going to point you guys to some external evidence as to why I think um, these extra verses were added later and why we don't need to freak out about that. So first, I want you guys to see this. This is the Codex Sinaiticus. That is not a magic spell. That is this book here. <laughs> This is the oldest surviving complete copy of the New Testament. This is one complete copy and it is beautiful and awesome and we get a lot of our interpretations from this book. Now this uh, Gospel of Mark ends at verse 8. And again, this is the oldest complete copy of the New Testament. There's also the, the Codex Vaticanus and all these other texts that I'm not going to get into because we're getting super nerdy now and you don't need to really know all that. Here's what you need to know. A lot of the older manuscripts and the more reliable manuscripts don't contain verses 9 through 20, okay? So that's the external evidence, so why I think uh, we're going to exclude that. Now, there is internal evidence within Mark that also points to excluding those verses, and I'll share some of that with you. Now, I don't know if you guys have noticed, as we've gone through Mark, uh, Mark is not what we would call a literary genius. Uh, he's not super eloquent with his words. As he writes, he goes, and then this happened, and immediately this happened, and immediately after that, this happened. Right? If you look like at the beginning of the book, he dives right in. If you look at the end, he just kind of stops. Right? Find me in uh, verse 8 here. Let's see how Mark ends this gospel of Jesus. Verse 8 says, They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid the end. <laughs> <laughs> you look at that and go, what? What kind, of, what kind of thing is that? It's like the local brother that tells a story and just ends with, cause was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's the end, yup, that's it, bro, what's nuts, right? This is Mark. Mark very much writes this way. Now, so there's a lot of words in verses 9 through 20 that are used that Mark doesn't use. And so the vocabulary is foreign in those verses. A lot of the concepts are foreign in those verses. We see uh, Jesus called Lord Jesus in verses 9 through 20. That's nowhere else in Mark. But here's where we do find that, Luke 24. In fact, a lot of 9 through 20 comes from Luke 24. We have the road to Emmaus. We have Lord Jesus. Verses 12 and 13 come from Luke 24. Verse 15 comes from Matthew 28. It's the Great Commission. Verse 18 comes from Acts 28. Paul gets bitten by a snake. Here's what I'm saying. 
I don't want you to look at verses 9 through 20 and go, oh man, we have this like bogus addition to the word. Not at all. Because everything that you see there is elsewhere in scripture. Right? So it's not like you can look at that and go, oh, okay, well, none of this is true. But I want us to understand why that may or may not be there. Right? As Bible students, we want to come to it honestly and, and wrestle with these things. So again, don't look at 9 through 20 and think that all of that is bogus. You can find all of those other things in scripture. Now, here's the biggest evidence for why I think that we should exclude these verses, and it was what I said earlier. This is just how Mark writes, right? Mark begins his gospel real abruptly and ends it real abruptly, so much so that this exists on the internet. Matthew, Luke, and John, hey, before we dive in, let me tell you about the genealogy. Let me tell you about all the events leading up to this. Let me tell you why it's important to know that he's the son of God. Mark, let's get down to business. <laughs> Mark dives right in, and when he's done, he dives right out. <laughs> was unreal, they was tripping, they was afraid. <laughs> so this is why I believe there's all the evidence that kind of points to excluding those verses, right? So we're just going to end in verse 8 today. So if you would, find me back in verse 1, and let's see what's happening. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Now, this is awesome. These women have been with Jesus for a long time. We see that they ministered with him when he was in Galilee. They followed him. They are there at the cross. They are there when he dies. They are there when he's taken down. And they are there when he's buried. These women are faithful. And they come and they minister and they do all these things. And so they see Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus bury Jesus. And immediately, they go and start gathering spices because they're going to come and anoint him. Now, me being the Portuguese that I am, immediately thinks these girls are going, oh, these guys didn't do it right. And now they got to go get all these spices to come and cover and do it again, right? So they're going to come very early on the first day of the week. And this is beautiful because we see so many godly characteristics in these women, right? We see faithfulness. That even though the Savior that they loved has died, they're still going to serve him. We see love. They care for him and they will pour out their love to him. We see sacrifice and that they bought these things. We see integrity and that they are willing to do what they have set out to do. We see discipline. We see righteousness. We see all of this amazing stuff in these women. Now, I'm going to say this, right? We, we, we can serve this way too with all of this love and devotion and care. But what these women are doing are missing one very, very important thing. And that's faith. They have love. They have devotion. They have integrity. They have care. But they have not faith. And here's why. They came to anoint a dead man. They came to anoint a dead man. And Jesus had told them, I will rise again on the third day. What they desire to do is a good thing. And they know that Jesus said, Jesus told them, and they know this, Jesus said he would rise again. So they know the truth, but they are not expecting it to happen. And there's a very big difference between those two things. They know the truth, but they are not expecting it to happen. If they expected Jesus to rise again, they would have bought popcorn to the tomb, not spices. Right? You need to kick up your lawn chair and go, I am waiting for this. <laughs> but they bring spices. They're going to anoint a dead Messiah. Now, for us in the room and my family online, Christ has told us that he will come again. He told these ladies, I will come again. He has told us, I will come again. These ladies went to the tomb with love and devotion and care, but no faith. My question for us today is how do we show up to church? With love? devotion, right? Sacrifice. Do we come with faith? Do we come expecting God to be God? Do we live as though we are expecting Jesus to come back? Because for most of us, we know that, right? Conceptually, we understand. We've heard that Jesus said he was going to come back. But do we live that way? Do we live expecting that he will come back? Do we share the gospel expecting that the sovereign God will work? Do we, do we pray expecting that God loves us and cares for us and wants to do mighty things? I'm going to ask this, the way that we come to church, do we come with the, the love, the sacrifice, the devotion, but no faith? And here's what that looks like. It's just another church service, just another song, right? I'm going to stand up and sing because Matt has asked me to. I don't really feel like I'm going to get through this and get to my lunch. I'm going to pray, but you know, God hasn't answered me yet. Right? We can come with devotion and love and care and integrity and sacrifice, but do we come with faith? Because if we come with faith, here's the difference. We come into the gathering of the saints trusting that the almighty God desires to speak to his people right now, among whom I am a son. You are sons and daughters. 
If we know and understand that the same God that spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai desires to speak to us here today, there's no way we come with the attitude of, here we go again. When we worship, do we worship expecting that our God sees us? Do we worship with faith that he is awesome, that he will come, that he will heal us, that he will reconcile us, that he will do all these things for us? Do we pray expecting God to do mighty things? Faith without which it is impossible to please the Lord. Family, when we come to church, we come to this building, we gather as saints, let us never come without faith. Because I promise you, for those of you in here who are struggling with stuff, who are backsliding, who have doubts and fears, who are going, ah, I don't know if this Jesus thing is for me. God is mighty. He is holy. He loves you and he desires to speak to you today. And like I said earlier, whatever you're looking for, you will find if you come looking for just another Sunday, oftentimes it's what you'll find. Now don't get me wrong, God rocks people's lives. First time I came here, I was expecting, all right, here we go. Yeah, Jesus wrecked my life that day. <laughs> he has turned me upside down. I was not expecting for my life to be different, but I promise you, the almighty God did mighty things. Let us come to this gathering of believers in faith, trusting that our God desires to move. Let us not serve with devotion and love a dead Savior. He will come again. He is risen. The resurrection has happened. And our King will come again. Now, I know I said he is risen. I'm sorry if I spoiled the end of the story for some of you. Uh, Jesus comes back from the dead. Sorry. <laughs> if you didn't know, it's been public knowledge for like a couple thousand years now. Um, and so this resurrection, right, we have this narrative that is told from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And part of uh, the difficulty of the resurrection for a lot of people is people see what they call contradictions, right? Things that one writer said that the other writer didn't say that people get all tripped up about and go, see, look, Bible has contradictions in it. It's not the word of God. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them because we would be here for hours. Uh, so I'm just going to show us one. And the reason I'm going to show us this is so that we understand. Again, we take the word and we seek God. We will see truth. And so here's one of the uh, alleged discrepancies we see in the resurrection narrative. So find me in John 20, verse 1. Sorry, this will be overhead for you. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, notice, while it was still dark, and saw the stone that had been taken away from the tomb. Now, if you look at Mark 16, verse 2, it says, they came when the sun had risen. John 20 says, it's still dark. Mark says the sun had risen. Now, if you grew up here on the island, you know that if you're out on the beach and the sun rises, the second it starts peaking, you got light, All right? So how can the sun be up and it still be dark? Well, you would have to have something in the way, right? Where does the sun rise? In the, oh, we had one Akamai Boga in here. Yes, in the east. <laughs> My man is proud. Yeah, you go get him, bro. The sun rises in the east. Thank you. Guess what is to the east of Jerusalem? That would be the Mount of Olives. Remember I said you have to have something in the way? Now, I want to show you guys this video. This is the sunrise from the Mount of Olives over Jerusalem. So the camera is set on the Mount of Olives. Notice these first couple seconds here. There she is. And so that's the sunrise coming up over the Mount of Olives. And so the sun is coming up behind it, right? And that's overlooking Jerusalem here. Now, I took this picture uh, early on in the video. So we have this seeming contradiction. The sun is up but it's still dark. Now in this picture, is the sun up? Yep, you can see it bouncing off the dome of the rock there, dead center. How's the land? Still dark? Oh, <laughs> him work, okay. Can the sun be up and it still be dark? Yes, you wanna know how you would know this? It's if you were there when it happened. So you can look at this John and Mark thing and go, oh, see contradiction, or you can go, hey, maybe I wasn't in Jerusalem. Maybe that's actually what it looks like in Jerusalem when the sun is up. By the way, for those of you still looking here, the Dome of the Rock is that little light. To the north is that uh, tomb I showed you guys last week, and it is still dark over that tomb. So, like I said, whatever you're looking for, you will find. You can take that at first glance and go, oh, see, it's a contradiction. Or you can dig and search, and God will show himself faithful, because this is the word of God. All right? Okay, so now that we have established that, let's continue to go on and see what's happening in this resurrection narrative. Find me in verse 3. And that they were saying to one another, meaning the women, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, 
They saw that the stone had already been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Now, why would the women be concerned about rolling this stone, right? We know it's big, but if Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus could roll it into place, why would the women have such a hard time rolling it away? Now, uh, anthropology and archaeology tells us that women of this day were a lot shorter than they are now, average about like five feet, probably like 90 pounds. And the, the stones that they found from this period were about 1,500 to 4,000 pounds. You can do the math, I'm not going to. Um, you figure it out. But, well, well, then why would two men be able to roll it into place but have such a hard time rolling it out? So here's a picture of one of the uh, tombs that they found. Now, if you notice, the rock would roll down something of a slant or a hill. And so if you wanted to get it into place, you would remove whatever block was there and just kind of get it off and it would roll the rest of the way, right? Rolling a stone downhill, easy. Rolling stone uphill, not so much. So this is why the women have this concept of, first of all, this thing is heavy. Second of all, we've got to get it of this thing. How are we going to roll this stone up the hill? Now, uh, quick side note for all my Bible nerds in here. There have been many archaeological digs in and around Jerusalem. One archaeologist I saw, his name is, uh, let's see here, Amos Cloner. This man set out to prove that Jesus' stone was not a disc-shaped one, but a square one. And here's what he found. Out of the 900 first temple, second temple tombs that he found, only four of them were disc-shaped. And so he said it's really unlikely that Jesus' was disc-shaped because the disc-shaped ones only belong to the wealthy and the royal. Aha, uh -huh. Joseph of Arimathea was rich. Jesus is the king of the Jews. Nailed it. And so in his desire to disprove that it was this shape, I'm sitting there going, dude, you're just proving the Bible right. One of his, uh, his evidences was, listen, the angel sat upon this disc-shaped stone. It'd be really hard to sit on something that's disc-shaped. An angel can roll this thousand-pound stone, but he can't sit on it? Come on, man. We forget that God is awesome. And so we can see that the tomb, the stone was rolled away and all this stuff. And the ladies came and the stone is already rolled. And here's what I love about this. Their concern was a very reasonable one. It would have been impossible for the three of them to roll that stone on their own. But what they could not do, what was impossible for them to do in the service to God, God did for them. God made sure that what was in their way was moved. Check this out. Matthew 28. This will be overhead. This is an explanation of how the, the stone got moved. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. That's a boss move if I've ever seen one. <laughs> right? He rolls it away and then he sits on this thing. Verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. A.K.A. they passed out. This was so awesome that they passed out. Now, what I love about this story is this. The, you know, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they got together and they went to Pilate and said, hey, we need a guard to guard the tomb so that they can't take the body of Jesus away. They were trying to prevent the resurrection. All they did was provide witnesses. Right? These men who are supposed to guard the tomb have now witnessed the glory and holiness of God. You cannot stop God's purposes. Right? Now here's the second thing that I love. These women were concerned about the stone. They knew it would have been impossible for them. God saw things that were in their way that they didn't even register. They had no idea there were guards guarding this tomb. God took care of it. How many times has God done that for us? Right? The obstacles that we see and we stress and we worry about, that God, how am I gonna how am I gonna do this? There are things we don't even register that God is caring for. Because God is awesome. He sees things that we don't see, things that in are in our way that are blocking us. God will go before us and move them that we might come to him, that we might serve him, and that we might love him. What was impossible for these women, God did. And this is very much in line with God's character. Things that are impossible for us, God does. Think of Abraham and Sarah. All right, Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100. Pretty sure my man's hip was going out, right? Like, you're going to have a son. How are we going to have a son? What is impossible for them, God does, right? Think about the Red Sea. You have all these Israelites, mass exodus from Egypt. Now they're standing at this body of water with no game plan. And all God tells Moses is, hey, lift up your stick, so he does, and the sea parts. Moses does not part the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. What is impossible with man, God does. David and Goliath, same thing. 
This little shepherd boy is fighting some nine foot six giant. You think it was his rock that took him down? Uh Uh-uh. God took out Goliath. You see what I'm saying? When things are impossible for us, God steps in and does what he must. Now, what is it that is impossible for us here today? Our battle with sin is impossible for us to win without God. Sin will always be the biggest problem that we face, whether it is our own or someone else is against us. This will always be the biggest problem that we face. And without God, we cannot move that stone. But we are not without God. Paul explains it this way in Romans 7. And so he's, he's uh, airing out these frustrations of like, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. And then he says this, a wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And the answer, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Who will save me from myself? God will. I cannot do it. God must move on my behalf. Now listen, we are asked a lot of impossible things in scripture. To fully deny myself, to think of others as more important, to not be proud, to be caring and kind all the time, to love my wife like Jesus loved the church. I don't know if you know this, Jesus loves perfectly. That is impossible for me to do. But where I fall shy, God moves. God can do the impossible. He can reconcile broken relationships. He can restore dead men to life. He can take sinners and make them saints. What is impossible with us, God does. Listen, if you ask around the people sitting around you, there are testimony after testimony of what was impossible with us, God did for us. Because our God is awesome. He does not fail. He cannot. And so, who will roll the stone away for us? The same God that rolled that stone is the one that desires to move in our lives today when things seem and look impossible. Trust him. He is awesome. Let's go back into the narrative and find what's happening here. Verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 tells us, Entering the tomb, so the ladies enter the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Now, that word amazed, right? It means astonished or affrighted or alarmed. They don't know how to respond to this because this is different, right? It's not like they walk in, see the dude in white and go, oh, super white, he's clothes. Wow, what kind bleach you use? They are amazed or alarmed because this is not some normal person. This is of God. This is an angel sent as a messenger to speak to these women. That is the first reason they are amazed. The second reason they are amazed is, that's not Jesus. We saw them bury him right here in this tomb. We saw where they laid him. We know where he should be. They come in and he's not there. And there's this angel sitting there. Of course they're tripping up. They are amazed or alarmed because what is happening here is not of men. This is of God. And I love what the angel says. He has risen. He is not here. I want that on my tombstone. He is risen. He is not here. Listen, my body will fail and I will die, but I will not be in the grave. Because my God has done the work on my behalf to raise me to eternal life. He is not here. He is risen. Now, I love that the other gospels say the same thing. Matthew 28, 6 says this. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said, come, see the place where he was lying. Luke 24 tells us, he is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day, rise again. Jesus told them exactly what would happen, and still they were not ready. I pray that we are. He is risen. He is not here. Now, the resurrection is of the utmost importance to the Christian. This is the utmost importance. We lose the resurrection a lot when we talk about the gospel, right? Usually, like Waxer was saying, the gospel ends at the cross for a lot of us. Uh Uh-uh. The resurrection is power. This is how important it is. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile or useless, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 
If in Jesus we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. The short version of this says, if the resurrection didn't happen, then Christians, sucks to be us. We are to be pitied among the world, the most, because if our faith in Jesus is good for only this life, rough stay for us. If Christ has not raised, but that tomb is empty. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. God has raised him. He has raised himself. He has come back to the power of life. The grave has been defeated. The head of the serpent has been stomped out. Jesus is risen. And so we need not worry. The power of Christ over death is awesome. Acts says it was impossible for the agony or the pangs of death to hold Jesus. He was never going to stay in that tomb. Death was never going to hold him. And now it can no longer hold us. Because of what Jesus has done, we can sing and praise and worship him. Now, I don't know if you guys know this. We as Christians sing some super weird songs. <laughs> if you come in, who's, as somebody who's not a Christian, and you listen to the songs we sing, we're a bunch of weirdos. We sing stuff like, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forward to carry me home. You know the song he's saying? Hallelujah, I'm dying. <laughs> we're a bunch of weirdos. We'll sing stuff like, I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. We're a bunch of weirdos. If Christ has not been raised, but if he has, and that resurrection life is also promised to us, I'll fly away, oh glory. Because Christ has raised from the dead, and that same power is available to the sons and daughters of God. Not just when we die. We are new creations now. That affects us today. I am a new creation. I can stare temptation in the face and say, no, I am a new creation. When Satan tries to remind me who I was, I can say, sorry, that is no longer who I am. Christ has given me new life. We need not listen to the voices of the flesh and those who remember who we were because God has already spoken the resurrection. That newness of life is available to us. And for Jesus, the statement was, he is not here. He is risen. Hallelujah for that. Now notice this angel tells these ladies now, behold the place where he is lying. And here's why I love this. God is not above being inspected. A lot of times we're afraid to ask God questions or to show us stuff because we're thinking, oh man, this holy God, he can't be inspected. God is inspected many times throughout scripture. Now I will say this, there is a big difference between inspecting God and testing God. Inspecting God means searching for the truth. Testing God means acting dumb. <laughs> if I say as a son of God, I am protected by him, and I go jump off a cliff and go, check this out. When you guys come visit me in the hospital, okay, remind me, you are testing the Lord. That's what Satan tries to do with Jesus, right? You're the son of God. He says he's going to protect you. Jump. Jesus doesn't go, okay, let me prove my faith. <laughs> he says, do not test the Lord. So God is not about being tested. In fact, if you test him, a lot of the times you will find yourself very humbled. But he is not above being inspected. See the tomb where he is laying, right? We, when we see Thomas saying, I will never believe that he is raised from the dead unless I place my fingers in his hands and my hand in his side. What does Jesus do? Thomas, here are my hands. Place your fingers in them. Bring your hand. Place it into my side. He inspects Jesus, and Jesus brings himself to Thomas that he might be inspected. And Thomas goes from, I will never believe, to my Lord and my God. God is not above being inspected. He actually invites us to seek him. He says, if you seek me with all that you are, you will find me. There is no greater treasure to be found than Jesus. If you're here today and you're wondering, ah, I don't know about this God thing, hey, seek him humbly. Like I said, whatever you're looking for, you will find Seek him. He is faithful to reveal himself. The more we seek God and his glory, the more of his glory we will see and the more beautiful this life becomes because we understand that this life is not our home. This is not it. We will raise the newness of life with Jesus. So let's dive back into the text here. Find me at verse seven and eight. This angel is speaking to the ladies and he says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, 
He is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid the end. <laughs> My man Mark. So we see all of these words, right? We see amazement and astonishment and trembling. They're feeling all of these things. They don't know how to process because this is awesome. The tomb is empty. There's this angelic being. He's giving them messages. Go tell the disciples. And notice he says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Now, a lot of people wonder why he singles out Peter, right? And generally, people tend to throw out, well, it's because it's the disciples and that Kolohe guy over there, right? I don't think that's it. Think about the day that Peter just had. Think about the last couple days that Peter just had. Peter rebuked Jesus after Jesus told him he's going to go die. Then Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, I will never deny you. Then he denied him, right? Everybody is having all of this argument. They're trying to take Jesus away. What does Peter do? My man starts swinging, right? Cuts off some dude's ear, gets scolded by Jesus for doing that. Then they take him away. Peter follows at a distance. He is now confronted by this servant girl, denies Jesus three times, locks eyes with Jesus after the third time, cries, and runs away. <laughs> Peter's had a rough couple days. So why does Jesus say, tell the disciples and Peter? Here's why. Peter needs to understand that he is still loved by Jesus. Not as a group, but as an individual. Jesus loves Peter. And I'm going to say the same to you. Jesus loves you, not just as the church, but as an individual. Your name, tell my disciples and Peter. Peter needs to know that he is still loved that God still cares for him and he still counts him among his sons and his faithful disciples. Go tell my disciples and Peter. Jesus loves him. And this is why he has his angel call him out. He says his name to comfort him. Come and meet with the rest of us. Now, if Jesus is still going to count Peter among the disciples, uh, there's very few things that we can do to cast ourselves out of being the disciples. Peter was when Kolohe brought a guarantee. This man spoke before he thought, swung before he calculated, like he was out there. Jesus restores Peter. And if he will restore Peter, he will restore us. Nothing that you do can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it is because God is awesome. His love is awesome. He doesn't love us because we're cute and cuddly, because I promise you, a lot of the time, we're not. He loves us because he is awesome, not because we are awesome. This is the gospel. Tell the disciples and Peter. If he will restore him, he will restore us. When we are faithless, he is faithful for he cannot deny himself. And notice he says to them, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee just as he told you. So to you, my family, I say, he has gone ahead of you to prepare a place for you, just as he told you. If Jesus is faithful to show up in Galilee for these disciples, oh, he is waiting for us in the kingdom. Jesus has gone before us into the grave and out of it. He has gone before us, seated at the right hand of the Father. He has gone before us to prepare us a place and he will bring us to him because he is awesome. What could we have done to deserve this? Nothing. This is the beauty of the gospel, and that we cannot deserve or earn God's love. It is a free gift of grace. And we see it given here to Peter. We see it given here to these women. We see it given to all the disciples. Because God is awesome. No sin, no amount of sin, discards us or discredits us or disqualifies us from the love of God. Jesus desires that all men come to salvation, to know him. So if you're here today and you're hearing about this Jesus thing and you're not sure, this is what I'm telling you here. You need Jesus. This man is a savior. He loves you. He cares for you as an individual and he wants you to come to him. And what does he ask of you? Faith. That you trust that he alone can bring you into the heavenly kingdom with his father because we have sinned. All of us have sinned. We cannot enter into God's kingdom on our own. We need Jesus to do it for us. This is what happened on the cross. My sin was laid on the back of Christ and taken for me, that if I trust in him and his rising again from the grave, I will rise with him in a newness of life.
Aloha, I'm Duke and I'm an associate pastor here at One Love from our Windward campus. I want to say thank you for tuning in today. I hope that you were inspired and strengthened by today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and to fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay united during this time of separation, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube and you want to stay informed about new content on our channel, hit the subscribe button below. Most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at office at onelove.org or call us at 808-955-9335 and let us pray with you. Our ministry leaders are ready to serve you. If you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, check out goodnewshawaii.com. There you will find five short videos about living a life in Christ and the free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning into One Love today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.